I'm Laura Lee with Digging Up Roots of the Boo. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm here with Bob Sorrentino, and we are going to be talking about Italian American heritage. If you like our content and you want to support the channel, be sure and give it a thumbs up, like the video, and also subscribe and hit the notification bell. You can also feel free to share it with other Italian Americans who you think might enjoy our content. Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from ItalianGenealogy.blog. And I'm here today with Laura Lee Watson from Digging Up Roots in the Boot. So welcome, Laura Lee. Nice to have you. Well, thanks for having me, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here today. Oh, my pleasure. So my first question for you is, obviously, Watson's not an Italian name. So what is your Italian roots and where does your family come from? Okay, well, I'm 50% Italian. My Italian mother married an Irish Englishman. So I'm 50% Italian and 50% Irish, English, Scottish mix. My Italian roots come from two different areas. My mother's paternal side comes from Sicily and three separate towns there. One of them is Lercata Fridi. The other one is Cefalu. And the other one is Valle Duomo. And they're all in like a little triangle in the province of Palermo. And then my mother's mother's family comes from the region of Abruzzo in two different little towns there. One of them is called Casoli, and the other one is a pretty big city. It's called Chieti. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know any of those places. Obviously, I know Palermo, but I don't know any of those little towns. But that's the way it goes, I guess, in Italy. There are so many of those little tiny towns floating around. Uh, so what got you started in trying to find your family roots? Well, I grew up like so many Italian Americans in an Italian American household where we had big Sunday dinners and we always had family around and there was always a lot of activity, a lot of food, a lot of loud voices and big personalities. And then um, as I got older and as things change in the United States, you know, I'm sure, is that families disperse. You know, some of the relatives moved to another state, and then my family moved to Arizona. And we started to all, you know, go all the way across the United States in many different areas, and we kind of lost that contact. And then when the grandparents and their brothers and sisters started dying and not being there anymore, then, you know, it made me more curious about, okay, why didn't I ask all these questions when they were alive? I have so many questions about my family in Italy. And that's what really made me start going after finding out more about my family. I know, and I, I had a similar situation. Obviously, I come from you know, two big Italian families and the Sunday dinner and all of that. And um, I never really asked a lot of questions when I was a, a kid. You know, just wasn't something that you would think of, I guess. Uh, and now I'm so sorry that I didn't. Um, you know, I did glean some information from, from some of the family. Um, but now, so you started your research, and uh, you took it to the next step once you started finding things out, right, and, and actually went to Italy. Well, actually, I kind of did it backwards, Bob. I came to Italy first, and then I decided I'm here. I feel something, because I don't know about you, but I think that Italian is in your blood. There's like some kind of blood memory. As soon as I came to the country, I realized I belong here. There's something about this place that really resonates with me. And that's what really got me interested in digging up more into my family history. And so from there, I visited my ancestral villages. I started doing some research online. And at the same time I was doing that, I was also gathering all of the documents that I needed to get my dual citizenship. Yeah, and I think we all have that. And, and um you know, I, I spoke to one person who's, she's kind of like a spiritualist, uh, which was pretty neat. And when I was talking about that drive that we all have, and it's not everybody in the family, it seems that we're like chosen. And she said, you're not far off. She said, they want to know, or they want you to know, and they want you to find them. And that's why some people have that drive. And, you know, it's a kooky kind of thing, but it does make sense to us that have that drive, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I mean, you know, an interesting story about that is I started to find out more about my family that is actually still here in Italy. Um, come to find out that back in the late night, no, the early 1980s, we had a giant family reunion, as we did every couple of years at the time. 
And there was actually a cousin of mine that was originally from Sicily, but his branch of the family went to Belgium. And I didn't know he was there at the time, but I contacted his son and found out that he was at the same family reunion I was at in the 1980s. Wow, that's really interesting. And um, yeah, I, you know, I found people that I never knew on Facebook and, and doing my research. And um, my, my two families come from two vastly different places and two vastly different um, social st strata, if you will. Um, my mom's family, they were poor farmers from Bari, and my uh, dad's family from Naples, uh, his father's family were gentry of sorts, I guess. Uh, his grandfather was a lawyer, his grandmother's family came from lawyers, but my maternal, my, I'm sorry, my paternal uh, grandmother comes from two very noble Italian families, Caracciolo and Piramalo. And uh, when I started researching them and getting into it, it was really, really fascinating. Yeah, it is amazing. Once you start doing the research, the things that you find, because you're not only looking at documents, the documents end up telling you a story. And I find right. that very intriguing. Yeah, I find that very intriguing also. So, so you go to Italy, you start doing this research, and... Um, what kind of amazing things did you find when you started, you know, looking back in time? Well, I found out a lot of interesting things about my family, uh, you know, where they were from. There was always stories in the family that they came from one particular town, um, Cefalu, which is in the north coast of Sicily in the province of Palermo. And it's a pretty big touristic place right now. Um, whereas one side of the family did come from there, but they ended up settling very early on in this little mining, this little sulfur mining town of Lercata Frivi. And um, that's where my great-great-grandfather was born. And my great-grandfather was born before they came to the United States in the early 1900s. So they, they came to the United States. Now, that they, I, I know a lot of Italians when they came um, kind of picked up on on the skills that they had over in Italy. So that because they were the mining town, did they have special mining skills that they, when they came, they settled in a mining area? Well, actually, no, this is interesting. And I don't know if this is because my great, great grandfather's family was originally from Chefalu. My great, great grandfather's profession was actually a chauffeur. It was his job to drive the horse and buggy and he would transport people from town to town in the horse and buggy. And interestingly enough, when he came to the United States, he was also a chauffeur for somebody, and so was his oldest son. Oh, that's pretty neat. Yeah, the first chauffeur I've come across. <laughs> most of us, most of us, like my my mom's family, were all you know farmers and uh, seamstresses. And when I was reaching her family, and I came across probably back oh, I don't know, hundred hundred and twenty years ago or something like that. I came across someone who was a forest ranger, and I said, oh, finally, somebody does something different. Um, and, and my uh, dad's mom, her family, some of the records, uh, simply say things like property owner, or in one case, it actually said rich person for occupation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's it. I mean, you pretty much had two primary types of professions. You had the very, very poor. You had the very, very rich. But then there was also the middle class. You had a lot of shoemakers. You had a lot of iron workers and skilled trade. So, I mean, you could see those across the documents. But obviously, people left Italy because they weren't making a good living. So they were usually very poor, or they left Italy during the fascist time because they were very, very rich, and their land and their money was being taken from them. Yeah, and that was the, one of the interesting things about when I was researching my grandmother's family. Um, I couldn't figure out why she came, because even, even after unification, they still seemed <clears throat> to uh, be doing pretty well. Um, and then I discovered that her aunt came in 1905 and the Piramalo family it's a very uncommon name so pretty much everybody I found is you know some sort of cousin or related in, in some way um, but when I found that I said well that must have been 
the reason that she came. Her aunt had come in 1905. They came, I, I still can't find out when my grandfather came because he came by himself. Uh, but my grandmother came with her first, or their first three children in 1950 and, and you know, settled in New York City. And my uncle started a business, a, um, a uh, embroidery business with his brother. Uh, somewhere probably around, you know, 1918, 1919, or somewhere around there. Um, so I'm assuming you've done at least one DNA test or several DNA tests. So did you find anything interesting with, with those results? Actually, I have not done a DNA test yet. I plan on one in the future. It's just not the right time for me now. One thing that I do know about my family that's quite interesting that I found out while doing research is there was always a story that my grandfather told us when we were young. He's like, you know, did I ever tell you that me and Frank Sinatra are first cousins? And I could always hear my grandmother from the other room yelling at Johnny, stop telling stories. And so we always thought it was a joke that he was related to Frank Sinatra. Well, doing family research, when I was gathering the documents for my Italian citizenship, I found out that Maria Sinatra was his mother's mother. So I thought, okay, so maybe there's some truth to this. So when I actually went to the town to do the research, I got into the church records. I went all the way back to 1745, and I found the link between Frank Sinatra's family and my family. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. So now is he, um, is it from the Sicilian side that he is? or Because uh, I know he grew up in Hoboken, but I'm not sure about where his family came from. He was born in Hoboken, uh, Frank Sinatra, in 1915. My grandfather was born in New York in 1916. So they're the same generation, and they're both first-generation Italian-Americans. But Frank Sinatra's paternal grandparents come from the same hometown as my grandfather's parents did, which is Lercara Fridi in Sicily. In fact, when you drive on, on the street where his great-grandparents or where his grandparents lived, you can see the plaque and the sign, and it gives the names and the dates of birth. And so with that information, I went to the church, and I searched in the church records, and I found the common link <clears throat> that goes back to um, – Three, there, Frank Sinatra's and my grandfather's three-time great-grandfathers were brothers in the mid-1740s. Wow, that's amazing. You know, like, like you said, when you start doing these things and just start to uncover stuff, you never really know what you're, what you're going to uncover. So other than Frank Sinatra, have you found anything else that, you know, is either amazing or maybe a little bit of a skeleton in the closet? Is it? Well, I, I did find something else that was amazing. I found that um, the relatives that immigrated to Belgium, there was also a famous singer amongst them as well. And he's actually very well known, and he sings in French. And uh, Federico Francois is his stage name, but his birth name is Francesco Baracato, which is the Italian lineage where I come from. And he goes back to Lercata Fridi once every two or three years, and he does a concert for them. There are some skeletons in the closet, but I don't think that I am open to mentioning them all on this podcast right now. But as every family, there definitely are some skeletons in the closet. No, I understand. I, I, I get that completely. And, um, you know, once you get around to doing it, doing the DNA, you, you may find out a couple other things that you didn't know. I, I found out... Um, couple of interesting things. One was a fraternity brother of mine that we we you know pretty close. We weren't just, you know, fraternity brothers. We were pretty close. And he contacted me and he said, uh, I just got my DNA back and I'm wondering if we're related. He says, I see uh, my DNA matches somebody MR that, you know, you're uh, managing. So I said, well, that's my wife. And it turned out that uh, my wife's mom is from Sicily and his family's from Sicily and they're fifth cousins. Um, the other interesting thing that came up is uh, I sent my DNA out to a few different sites just to see if I got any matches and I got contacted by somebody and she said, you know, we showed up as a very close match, like, you know, second cousins and I didn't know her. She didn't know me. Turns out she was adopted, and um, 
she was going to do ancestry because you know that's where they have the most of the cousin matches so she did the ancestry and she comes up well while i'm waiting i'm trying to figure out okay which one of my cousins does this girl come from and um she did the ancestry and she came back as a second cousin through one of my first cousins and her three half brothers and sisters had also done the test so they were all quite amazed um to find out that they had a, a half sister uh and when i asked to my cousin that i'm very familiar with i said did you ever know and she said no she said the only thing i can remember when i was about uh four years old my mom crying in the in the bedroom for about two weeks wow so that you know that is really amazing that you can find stuff like that that is very helpful for people who are adopted or are half siblings that um you can find these amazing matches now do you have a relationship with them today um yeah i mean you know not a close relationship i you know i did find out that she um lives in uh queens new york where we're all from uh i know that she's contacted uh you know our half brothers and sisters i don't i don't know if they met or not that much i don't know but i know they've been in contact with each other and you know it, it is what it is and there doesn't seem to be any animosity or anything like that so it all seems to be good as far as that goes now i think my family is a little bit unique in that situation whereas there's only one unique family with our surname in sicily and one of the brothers stayed in sicily one of them went to belgium and the other family all came to the united states so there are more people with my surname in the united states and belgium than there are in italy today so and i'm in contact with my cousins that are in sicily now i know them all oh, that's something and one other thing uh that i just remembered so my friend al um who's you know fifth cousin with my wife he found his half brother older brother that apparently from before his dad married his mom and you know we're going back to the 30s here right uh and he did make contact with them and he's he showed me pictures they look exactly alike isn't that amazing yeah it is something it is it, it is really something and uh so they you know they they have a a bit of a relationship mm-hmm. they've you know they've gone out to dinner and and met and their families met and um you know it, it is what it is and you did all this research you started researching your family and then you turned around and made a business out of it Yeah, I did. After I went through the process myself, um the highs and lows, I mean the highs obviously are meeting relatives and just, you know, visiting the ancestral villages and, you know, going through Italy and just experiencing the culture and the people. Those are all the highs. The lows and some of the things that were disappointing and discouraging were going through the bureaucracy of gathering the documents, understanding the process and actually getting from point A to B in the citizenship. From beginning to end it took me 3 years. And so I figured if I could help people make this easier for them going through the process, then why not do it? And that's how it all started. Yeah, that's really neat and and um you know I've I spoke with several other people who uh pretty much this started the same way. One person was very interesting because um she just made friends with somebody and that came from a a village near her up north and just decided to kind of lend a hand with her and they had never met, they didn't know each other. Um she came over to Italy and they spent time together and she showed her around and she kind of did the same thing. She said she enjoyed it so much. that she decided to make a business out of it. Um so now that you have this business so what kind of things if people need help whether it's citizenship or genealogy what kind of things that do you do to help people? Well, I offer four distinct services with what I do. Um obviously the first of all is doing the Italian document research. 
there are so many resources in the United States where you can go online and you can find documents in the United States and even documents in Italy up until a certain point. But then there's those records in Italy that you can't find, which are the church records, land records, notary records, which give a lot of information. And they're very helpful in going back further in your family tree, but also building your family tree horizontally as well. So that's one of the services that I offer. And the second thing that I do is I help people with their Italian citizenship. And I do that helping them administratively going through the Italian consulates in the United States. I also collaborate with an attorney here in Italy to help people go through the judicial process of, for example, 1948 cases. And I also help people who want to come here and establish residency and apply in Italy directly. The third thing that I do is I do customized Italian heritage tours. And what this means is that I take people to their ancestral villages and I show them, you know, if they want to do research in the records themselves, I accompany them to do that. They visit the churches where their ancestors were baptized. And we even try to locate it, if possible, the houses in the streets they lived in and grew up in as children. And the last thing that I do is I help them locate living relatives. And if they find the living relative and decide to come here on a heritage tour, I act then as an interpreter and translator for them during their visits so that they can easily communicate with the relatives. Because unfortunately, Bob, you know this today, a lot of Italian Americans don't speak Italian. So sometimes it's difficult to keep that communication going once you make the contact. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm so bummed out. My parents never taught us. I, I tried to learn a few times. I'm just not great at languages, unfortunately. I mean, I can now, you know, make out some of the stuff on the documents and, and things like that, but, you know, really, you know, at a disadvantage with some of that. But like I said earlier, you know, I, I was able to find a lot of people through Facebook and once I started doing the records and, um, you know, in, in my case, um, my dad's, his uh, older brother and two of his older sisters were born in Italy. Uh, his uh, the youngest daughter and my dad were born here. On my mom's side, um, uh, only my uncle, my oldest uncle, and uh, the oldest uh, daughter, my oldest aunt, were born in Italy. Everybody else was born here. And when my grandparents came, they left my uncle in the care of his grandparents, um, I think assuming that they would go back one day. Um, they never did. My uncle stayed there with his grandparents. They, whether he didn't want to come or they wouldn't let him go, I, I, I still don't know the whole story. But what happened was he wound up staying there. And then finally, when he wanted to come, he had already turned 18, couldn't come. He had to serve in the Italian army. He wound up getting married and having his family there. So he didn't come to the United States until 19. Uh, in the 1950s, and he had never met any of his brothers and sisters and hadn't seen my grandparents in 45 years. That's an absolutely amazing story. I mean, that is quintessential. And I think what I find when I listen to other people's stories is that there's this story similar to that in every family. Because not everybody went to the United States and many people did stay behind and there's anxiety attached with that separation. So how did your uncle feel when he finally came after all those years? Well, I could only, you know, go by the pictures. I, I was just a little kid when they came and he had first, um, he had first come into Canada. He was supposed to come to America and initially and my cousin, one of my cousins had a liver disease. Uh, that plagued her all her life, which they, which I learned that they think may have come from uh, from sheep. And they were about to come. She got sick. They couldn't come. Um, there was, I guess, you know, they didn't have money to do whatever they had to do. So uh, the story goes that a businessman, quote unquote, uh, came to Torito and was recruiting people to go work in the mushroom farm in Canada. And uh, the town collected money to send my uncle and he went to Canada. Uh, he was there, I believe, uh, five years with his family. Eventually he got 
the rest of the family over there. And my parents would, and uh, some of my other aunts and uncles would make the trip up to Canada to go see them and visit. And we're lucky to have a few things. First of all, my father was a, uh, a newsreel person and later a photographer for the Daily News. So we have home movies from the mid to late 40s of some of the trips that they made to Canada. And we also have my youngest cousin from that uncle. He interviewed my uncle in Bares, uh before he passed away. And when I found out about it, I said, Joey, you have to translate this for the family. And he said, you know, I tried once. I, I couldn't get through it. I you know, got all choked up. And I said, you have to try. You have to, you have to do this. This is history. And uh, he got together with his sister and they went through it. So we have the snapshot of what my uncle's life was from probably around 1917 through 1950 in Italy. I can't believe that. That's such a treasure. Your family is so lucky to have that. So many people wish that they had something like that about their family history, that they can only guess what things were like in Italy. Yeah, and you know, and I've you know, I talked to my older cousins. My oldest cousin, it was almost the same age of, as my mom, only a couple of years younger. Uh, so, you know, they were there through the war and, you know, how my, my aunt would gather up everybody and run to the fields when the bombs came. And um, my, um, she actually remembered my great grand- grandfather and said that, you know, he used to give her like, you know, candy every once in a while. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, as I was going through my family research and I was trying to piece together, you know, the immigration process and how they came to the United States, typically like so many other immigrants, my great grandfather came ahead of everybody else and established himself in the United States. And then he sent for my great grandmother. Well, my great grandmother traveled, and this is in the early 1900s, on the boat by herself with four children under the age of 10. And I think about that because they were on the boat for 20 to 30 days at that time. It wasn't an easy trip to make. And obviously, they were very poor, so they're in the steerage, which are not the best living conditions. And so if you just try to put yourself in that situation, you think how strong of an individual she had to have been to endure that with four kids, not speaking the language in the country she's going to, unaware of what lies ahead of her. I just have such admiration for any Italian that immigrated under those circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think, I think of my mom's mom, I, I think they probably came over the same same way. They only had, they came together and they only had the one child. Uh, my dad's mom came with uh, three children under probably, probably just under the age of 10. And, but I, I think they had a few bucks. So I don't think that, you know, she came in steerage. I'm guessing that maybe she came second class. So it probably wasn't as, as tough a journey. And uh, they already had some established roots here with my grandfather and um you know they seem to be for people from southern italy they seem to be a little bit better off at the time Mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's obviously different classes when you're coming across um, but the majority unfortunately the majority of immigrants that came across came across in steerage and they were in very very poor conditions And there was a lot of times where if you look through the Ellis Island records, if you're looking for any information, sometimes you can see that people are detained for health reasons. And they may have been put in quarantine once they arrived and maybe separated from the rest of their family for a period of time. And it could be pretty traumatic. Yeah, and we have recently um, seen a show about Ellis Island, and um, it it was really, you know, heartbreaking. I mean, on the one hand... The people who came right through, um, you know, it was was okay. Uh, I actually have um, know of a family member, distant family member. Um, the daughter was 16 and blind, and they sent her back, and the rest of the family stayed. Because of her medical condition, because of her blindness? Yeah, because they felt that, you know, she was going to be a burden to the state. Yeah, I mean, you hear a lot of those stories. You know, there's nothing worse than being separated from your family against your will. So 
If people want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? And, you know, wh- where are your sites? I know we'll publish all of that, but, you, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about how they can find you, uh, that would be great. My website is digginguprootsintheboot.com. And on my website, there's a contact page. If you want to get in touch with me, you can just go to the contact page of my website and send me an email there. I also have a YouTube channel um, at Laura Lee Digging Up Roots in the Boot. And I have right now 186 videos published, a combination of Italian genealogy, Italian language lessons for free at no charge, and um, some Italian citizenship and culture information. And um, I post once a week on the channel, so it's pretty regular. Then I have all of the social media accounts. You get in touch with me at Twitter at DRB Laura Lee and Instagram at Laura Lee dot DRB. Facebook, Digging Up Roots in the Boot. I'm also on Pinterest at Laura Lee DRB. And I also have an Amazon storefront. And I, I'll send you all those links so you can um, let them out to your listeners if they're interested. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm going to. Take you up on some of the learning Italian YouTube videos. Yeah, it's a great place to start. I mean, because learning Italian isn't easy. Let's face it. Italian grammar is not the easiest grammar to learn. But, you know, it's it's great because um, there's a couple of different teachers that I have giving the lessons online. They're Italian and um, they you can hear their accent. So you can practice your pronunciation and your listening skills with them. And they put lessons out at all levels from beginning to advanced. Okay, well, that's great. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today, and I'm sure we'll stay in contact. It's my pleasure, Bob. Thank you for having me. You're quite welcome. That's it for today's episode. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, stay rooted in it.